Because he's on a cloud chair, but um, it's no one's there. Good morning, Crazy Love. Good morning to everyone in person. Good morning to our online family. How's everyone this morning? Good? We're good? Enjoying the sunshine? <laughs> um, we have a couple, I have a couple exciting things to invite you all to in the next couple weeks. Um, Zoe's going to tell us about our missions prayer breakfast happening next Saturday. So we have a missions prayer breakfast happening next Saturday. It's from 9 to 10.30. And I mean, isn't it wonderful that God is at work in the world and that we get to join him in that work? And he's reconciling the world to himself. And so we're part of that, whether we're here in Walla Walla, at Crazy Love, or wherever you've been placed, or if you're scattered across the globe. Um, you may not know this, but Crazy Love, our Crazy Love family supports five global minister couples, uh, families, as well as Impact Nations that we give to as a church on a monthly basis. And we also want to support them in prayer and uh, just develop our familiarity and our love for them um, because just as we saw last week when we prayed for Heather and Michael heading out on mission um, we go with them you know that we're that's part of our crazy love family that is doing um, kingdom work in other places so I just want to invite you you maybe you have a heart for mission maybe you just want to um, have breakfast together with the Crazy Love family and um, pray together. And we have special guests that will be joining us on Saturday from 9 to 1030. And um, that is the Carlsons. Did you hear about the Carlsons? So the Carlsons are Mark and Miriam and their two kids, Boaz and Hope. And um, they are, I don't know how much time I'm supposed to share since we're live streaming, but they are um, been on mission first in China and then kind of on the Silk Road between China and Georgia. And um, so we're really excited. Miriam used to uh, be part of Crazy Love when she was in college, and we kind of sent her out, and she's done so many things, got married, had kids, and, and the, the mission, being on mission with God just continues um, wherever we are. And so we get to have them in Walla Walla for uh, six or seven days, and um, they'll be even speaking next Sunday, and they, they wanted to connect with our family, and so they're going to come on Saturday too. So I hope you can come and um, be part of it. That's like Saturday, um, 9 to 10.30. Um, I also just wanted to um, invite all of you married people to our first ever marriage retreat at Crazy Love. Um, you should see in your email, save the date for that. That's May 17th through the 19th. So um, just be on the lookout for more information about our marriage retreat. <sighs> I just want to invite you all to stand as we enter worship this morning. Psalm 103 as we um, enter worship. Bless the Lord, O my soul. We just say that together. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Yeah, Lord, this morning we just command our souls to bless you, Lord. We command our souls wherever we're at right now. We just command our souls to bless you, Lord, because you're worthy, God. You're worthy of our love and our affection, Lord. 
We just invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and have your way this morning. Wherever we're at, Lord, just come and minister your presence, minister your joy, your healing, your comfort. Lord, make us aware of your work in our hearts this morning, your work in our body this morning. We just say, come, Holy Spirit. Amen.
Holy Ghost, won't you come close to me? Holy Ghost, won't you come close to me? Holy Ghost, won't you come close to me? Holy Ghost, kiss my eyes, I, I want to see. Holy Ghost, won't you come close to me? Holy Ghost, won't you come close to me? Holy Ghost, won't you come close to me? And Holy Ghost, kiss my eyes, I want to see, I'm in need, I'm in need of your help, in need of your hand, in need of your love, Father.
close, won't you come close to me? Holy Ghost, won't you come close to me? Holy Ghost, won't you come close to me? Holy Ghost, kiss my eyes. next song we really uh, <clears throat> it was really put on our hearts this morning just to sing um, sing like we were in the throne room where every tribe, tongue, and nation bows before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords so at one point you're going to hear a few other languages and you know, is going to sing Mandarin and Nicole Espanol and I'm going to sing some Arabic so uh, and feel free just to jump in with your own language
انت وحدك مستحق فمنك كل الاشياء وبك كل الاشياء ولمجدك
In my mind, I imagine standing before the throne of God one day in the distant future with a voice saying, look all around you. Look at these nations. Look at every tribe and tongue. So they've gathered to worship before the throne. We see a tiny picture of that on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit is poured out. And a raucous was filled the upper room where the disciples had gathered to pray as they began to speak in other tongues that they had never known. As the wind of God and the fire of God rested on them, and all Jerusalem gathered around because of the raucous and to come and see what was going on and the diaspora from around the Mediterranean that had come to Pentecost to worship and to celebrate the festival began to hear them speaking in their own languages. It's a picture of eternity of the nations and the tribes and the tongues gathered to worship our Lord. And Lord, we thank you today for the privilege of being called that you've chosen us, Lord, and that you've invited us to partner with you to disciple all nations. Lord, we thank you for the privilege that you've given us over our 20 year history, Lord, to do so much in other nations and to partner to reach other tribes and tongues. And Lord, I just thank you. You're so good to us that you invite us into your story that you're writing in this earth. Though there are so many troubles, Lord, you invite us into the story of redemption to bring healing and hope. 
and we recognize your goodness this morning and we declare it and we say thank you in Jesus name Amen extension of our time of worship today, we get to take communion together. So if you're visiting with us, you're welcome to join us. Um, these are tricky little things to open though. So the top one is clear and you take it off first and you can find the little bread. And then the next one is foil and that one will get the juice out. So it's our privilege to do this together as part of our rhythm of life as we come together every Sunday. We, um, I think of it as just part of worship, just like that last song when we say, Jesus, you're worthy of it all. Like This is continuing to remember who Jesus is and what he did for us. Jesus Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father and when we take the bread and the juice we remember when Jesus right before he died he gathered with a group of his close friends and they were taking the Jewish Passover meal together and he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to them and he said this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me let's take the bread and when he took the cup of wine he held it up and he said this is the blood of my new covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. As we drink this juice, it's like we receive that truth and we receive Jesus into our lives all over again. Let's take the juice together. We bless these elements and we bless the work of God in our lives this week. Amen. We continue our worship with an optional offering and, and our um, regular giving. So Josh. into like new experiences and also circle back and graciously let us review old lessons and stir our hearts to worship. May you continue stirring our hearts to worship this morning and may you continue stirring our hearts to worship throughout our weeks and as we do dishes or we pass out crackers or we uh, put our children to bed for the fourth time or we like deliberately go to a prayer night like in all ways would you show us how to practice the presence of God to lift you up in worship because I'm not standing up here because I'm doing all that but because I want to do that and I recognize the need in me but like to to grow but because of your worth that you are worthy 
that you are worthy of our worship, you are worthy of our music, of our dance, of putting them to bed a fifth time. Um, you are worthy, God. Please uh, pass the baskets even as we pray. Jesus, thank you for what you've given us, especially if you've called Crazy Love your home. We invite you to give your tithe or your any other offerings as well. Um, just as you connect with the Lord, as he like connects with you, um, and there's a QR code that you can scan if you prefer to give online, um, or you can give through the website. And just in everything we do, Lord, we look to honor you. May it be. Where's that Andrew guy? May I pray for you? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Jesus, for Andrew. Thank you, Jesus, for crazy love. Thank you for the work that you've been doing in like the last 40 minutes and in the last 20 years. Uh, and we just are excited to see what you have for us in this moment. Amen. Bless you. Being left with a little raw shock test at the bottom. You hear the joke about Rorschach? He said, who's this guy called Rorschach and why did he do, do all these drawings about my parents fighting? <laughs> <laughs> Not my parents. <laughs> uh, let's do a fun little exercise because um, I thought about it in worship and then uh, the third song came on which I was looking for the words up there but apparently you've memorized them so you don't need lead sheets anymore. You don't have that third song, do you? The third song? Kiss my eyes, kiss Holy Ghost. Did you have the lead sheet? Oh, you used an iPad this morning. I was like, wow, you're br brilliant. Anyways, those words are real confirmation what I felt like. The Lord wanted to just do a little bit of ministry this morning. Um, and I felt like your worship really tied into this Sean and Fiona. Um, but I felt like um, the Lord wanted to touch our eyes this morning to see Jesus. So before I preach this morning, let's do that. Um, go ahead and put out your hands right now. We're going to ask for just the anointing of the Lord just to touch your hands. And then you, I'm going to have you put your own hands on your eyes uh, to see the Lord. So just wait a moment here. And uh, it's like Christmas morning always with Jesus. He loves to give good gifts. And we just extend our hands to receive gifts. So Lord, let your anointing come right now. Let your presence come. Thank you, Lord. Touch every hand right now. Uh, fill them with your presence, with your grace. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Okay, now go ahead and put your hands. To, do you, oh, before you do that, are you sensing the Lord's presence? Some of you sensing God's presence here? Is it, you sense the Lord's in your hands? Okay, so I think that's just a token that he's here. I just wanted to recognize him because I'm feeling him tingling in my hands. And if you're not feeling him, it doesn't necessarily mean he's not here, but he's uh, not touching you, just that he's touching some. I believe it's a token that he's here touching all of us. So um, go ahead and lay your hands now on your eyes or, uh, yeah. And Lord, we ask that you would um, open eyes right now. I just declare eyes be opened right now to see the Lord. Thank you, Lord. We ask that you would wash our eyes with eye self that we might see Thank you, Lord. Cleansing, calm. Great anointing, just calm to see the Lord. It says that as we behold him, we become like him. We are transformed from glory to glory as the same image, like looking in a mirror as we behold the Lord. And that's not just for the super saints. That is for every single follower of Christ, every single believer, every child of God. That is your right and your inheritance is to see and behold the Lord. So eyes be opened right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, yeah, so I just uh, look around. <laughs> from this point on, I think that you will all be different from this mark on. I just declare that um, as, a, as, a, as a mark, and I take note of what you see and let me know. But I just think something just has changed at Crazy Love. So that's cool. 
Okay, uh, this brings us to the finale, the grand finale of Rule of Life, and it is not necessarily the grand finale of Rule of Life in our rhythms and our Rule of Life, but in this preaching series. So this is the last of our preaching series, and I'll remind you at the end, but Heather is going to do a workshop for all of those who are interested, have been intrigued, and would like to find out more, or just I'm going to be a part of that. She's going to do a workshop and to help facilitate you all putting a rule of life together. And so even if you've got a rule of life, uh, one of the things that I think Ken Shigematsu and also Ruth Haley Barton encourages to do it each year, kind of reflect on your past year and adjust your rule of life accordingly. And so if, even if you've got one, you might find that there's some little tips that Heather shares or just doing it in community with other buddies. And you go, wait, that's a new rule of life. I want that too. And you might incorporate another practice because one of your buddies is doing it. So I think that'll be fun. I'll be there. I'll probably adjust my rule of life accordingly, too. So anyways, today is our last one. Well, for those who have maybe just joined us, uh, welcome to the last one. But the rule of life, I mentioned that word phrase a few times already. But it's an ancient practice of following in the ways of Jesus that it was established by St. Benedict around 500 A.D., and it's not rules of life, but rule of life. And a good rule of life, it, it's, it's, a, a, the, it's basically the ways of Jesus or the practices uh, that Jesus practiced. But a good rule of life will help you uh, experience really peace. And I felt like this morning was with regards to some of the things that we're sharing is, is really a deep sense of joy as our life rhythms kind come into alignment with our deepest desires and values. So when you have really strong values and deepest desires and your life is just too busy uh, to do the things that you really care about, you end up being really frustrated and will experience times of disappointment, disillusion, disoppression, depression, depression, etc. But when our lives begin to line up with what we truly value, we really experience peace and joy. Um, so the last part of our rule of life is called uh, this last tier or the last part of the trellis. Uh, often a rule of life is compared to a trellis, and it's the upper part of the trellis. And the last part is called reach out. And it includes the work that we do on a daily basis. It, call, it includes our service, includes doing justice, and our witness. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today, a whole bunch of stuff today. Uh, pray for me to get through it. Um, Heather is normally here. She's in Malawi today, probably preaching tonight uh, to maybe a thousand or so. We'll see. I don't know. We'll find out tomorrow uh, when she calls back. I don't know if today is an outreach day or a, or a training day, so we'll see tomorrow. Um, but and only she proofs my reading and tells me what to cut out. And so you get a 30-minute service with that. <laughs> Heather, you might, we might be here for a couple hours, so we'll see. Just intercesses. If we get done in 30 minutes, it'll be because of you. Um, <laughs> so this is the part of our rule of life uh, where our cup has been filled and flows over. In Psalm 23, 5, it says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with uh, oil. My cup runs over. Uh, this is the part of our rule of life where our root, our root practices like reading scripture, uh, time, spending time in solitude, spending time in prayer, things like community, our relationships, um, our restorative practices uh, cause the cup to be filled. And then this is where the cup is now overflowing and flowing to those beyond ourselves. Another picture of the cup overflowing, I think, of the reach out part is really communion this morning. When Jesus took the bread and broke it, it was a picture of his own body being blessed and broken and giving life to others. When we come and we receive communion, what we're doing is we are agreeing with that and we're offering ourselves to be broken to be blessed, and to be given to humanity to, so that life may come to them. Isn't that beautiful? So those are the couple pictures for you with regards to reach out. And I want to share, we're going to probably talk a, quite a bit of, on reaching out 
this year with regards to witness and also um, we've, got a, we've got a series on the, on the preaching schedule called Redemptive Justice. We're going to be talking about those two things um, a bit. And I'm going to just scan, scan through those. Those are towards the end of my message. I didn't want to leave them out, but I'm going to mention some few nuggets about them. But the thing in Ken's book, uh, God in My Everything, that really blessed me and I think will be a blessing to you that I'm going to spend probably half my time on this morning is, is what I, he calls, thank God, it's Monday, and I call redeeming our work because I found this super, this, this section super helpful for me. Um, so one of the things is being satisfied with your job, and I think if you, if most of our students are elsewhere, but this could apply if you're a student to being in school. Um, but being satisfied with your job often varies depending on your income, in this country at least. So depending on your income, your job satisfaction changes. And that also varies depending on your full-time status, whether you're full-time or part-time. So pe typically people that have a full-time status job are more, have more job satisfaction. But for many, work uh, often is not satisfying. And sometimes it's just a job to put uh, food on the table, a job to make money, and a job to get by. But we see God's intention for work starting right at the beginning in Genesis 2. So you can open your Bibles. There's a whole bunch floating around the room, or it just appears on the screen behind me. So in Genesis 2, 2, it says that God, on the seventh day, maybe, there it is. On the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which, we ha which he had done. Now, this job talks about him resting, but it also talks about him working. God is the original worker. Isn't that cool? And in God being the original worker, he created humans to be workers too. He intended for man to work even before the fall. So the fall being um, Adam messing up. Uh, Genesis 2, 7 says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. Now these words, tend and to keep, also mean to serve, to labor, to work, and to watch over and protect. And also, as a side note, to treasure it. Um, when man was living in relationship with God, work was a blessing. It was an opportunity to partner with God. And then hear the <laughs> ominous music. But then Adam, or man, was disobedient and caused a curse to come on the land. Let's look at Genesis 3. Then, Adam, he, then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. But thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. There have been numerous days where I felt that this verse was my reality, especially on a Monday. Perhaps you can relate, but I don't believe that this is God's intention. So this is where we're going right now. Although Adam's failure to obey resulted in a curse, Jesus has redeemed us from the curse. Galatians 3, 13 through 14 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. In Galatians here, Paul is talking about being redeemed and receiving the Holy Spirit through faith, that we've been redeemed from the curse. Now, this is the curse of the law of breaking the Ten Commandments. Now, Adam broke God's commandment of not eating from the, from the fruit that he shouldn't have eaten, and there came a curse on the land. Well, in the same way, I believe that by faith, similarly, by faith, we can see our work that we do become spiritual and redeemed from the curse that has resulted from disobedience. The last verse of Psalm 90 says this, Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us 
and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. I believe God intends to partner with us to bless the work of our hands. And we enter into this. What is the distinction before and after? It's faith, through faith. We enter into this through faith. We often have the tendency in our lives to separate the sacred versus the secular. So we often consider like maybe our Sunday morning or church uh, time together or our life in prayer as sacred and then the things that we do for our work as secular. But this is not how work is presented in Scripture. There's three verses. I just have to read them all because I feel like we probably need this point proved to us, right? <laughs> Especially tomorrow morning. First Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Colossians 3, 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that incredible? You may think that you're serving your boss tomorrow. You may be think that you're working for the dollar, but you're actually serving the Lord. And you may receive a paycheck, but you're receiving a far greater paycheck and inheritance from your heavenly Father because that is who you're working for. Let's look a little bit at Jesus. Jesus spent most of his earthly life working. For three years, his ministry the last about three and a half years of his life was ministry of healing, deliverance, preaching, teaching, discipleship. But before that, he had a ministry that was different. It was a ministry of building and chopping and stacking and digging. And in that ministry of work that lasted about 15 to 18 years, he learned obedience to his father's will. We also see such effective preaching and teaching in the stories that Jesus told that were rooted in his life of, of earthly experience. His teachings and his parables were so re re relatable because they were based on real world experience and not just simply on theories or ideas. Dallas Willard proposes that the primary place for spiritual formation is not our time in scripture or at church, but rather our workplaces, our schools, and our homes. To not find our jobs as a primary place of discipleship, he says, is to exclude a significant part of our waking hours. He further suggests that the gospel turns our jobs into a spiritual formation center. So the Benedictine monks definitely viewed their work in this way. Uh, they viewed their work as the primary place to grow towards union in Christ. They saw their work as foundational to their training in godliness. And if you are a stay-at-home mom, that is your work too. So I just want to encourage you. Don't, whatever your put your hand to, whatever your job is, whether you're a student, if you're a student, that's your job. Uh, but the Benedictine monks saw their work as foundational to training in godliness. Work was not seen as a curse, but rather a gift to serve the larger community. For the monks, their work was sanctified through prayer. For those laboring with their hands, they had more like manual labor. They had more time with, with their minds and their hearts to be available for prayer. What They could pray while they worked. For Benedict... Work in itself, regardless of prayer, had value as a devotional act of worship. Isn't that amazing? On the other hand, prayer was also considered work and called the work of God. For these monks, there was not a clear distinction between religious engagements and their labors. Most of us are familiar with praying before we eat, saying grace. It doesn't have to be a big show, like if you're in a restaurant, you don't have to all hold hands and bow your heads, make sure the whole restaurant knows that you're Christians. Um, you do that through tipping, actually, at the end. That's how, you, that's how you, they know that you're Christians, by your generosity. So it's not that you pray. But you pray in secret, but most of us are familiar with um, praying before we eat. And Ken Shigematsu says that we can introduce that practice into our workplaces 
And again, this doesn't have to be known by anybody, can be done in secret, but you have that meeting that you're com coming up that maybe you're not looking forward to or that, you know, uh, Google Meet with a whole bunch of people or maybe you have an assignment that's just being assigned to you um, or whatever it is, say a quick prayer. Invite God's presence into the moment. Invite his counsel, his discernment. Um, uh, Ken said when that he was doing this, um, it would lead to greater job satisfaction, making it more meaningful when he began to become aware of God's presence uh, with him at work. And Brother Lawrence, if you've re have not read that book, I encourage you to read that at some point in your life, Practicing the Presence of God. But Brother Lawrence practiced the, that. Um, he tells the stories of uh, being assigned the manual labor and the, 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 the mundane stuff and then learning to invite God's presence, like washing the dishes. I think, Zoe, you said that this morning, which I love that when things tie together. Um, Brother Lawrence would be washing the dishes and invite God's presence into that moment and just begin to experience God in these moments that would take up, for, for many of us, eight hours, but some of us, 16 hours in a day where the day is long, and why do we sacrifice that time to not be with God uh, when we can invite him to be with us in our practices uh, of labor? Um, the practice of praying at work also had the added value is that we get to have God's perspective on our work. We may find God might lead us to introduce or just uh, demonstrate integrity in our work. Um, if I don't know about y your industries that you are a part of mine is has a fair amount of integrity engineering uh it's kind of one of the code of ethics that we build stuff my my other vocation of dirt engineering um and civil engineering but we try to build stuff where people don't die when they ride over our bridges and go into our buildings and things so that's one of the <laughs> one of the things we do. So ethics is tends to be high, but I've run into situations where they're like, ah, we don't need to do a foundation. To, uh, you know, we can just build that reservoir on the side of the hillside. And I'm like, um, how did that work last time we did that? So um, there are times that we will be called to demonstrate integrity and the character of God in our workplaces. There's some of you, as even as I look around the room, that you're in industries which are known for the lack of integrity. And so you get to demonstrate God. And I know that uh, at least one story, which is, takes me down a rabbit trail, which I won't go to, but I know at least one person that's done that over and over again and has been rewarded greatly for the integrity. So um, the other thing is that when we invite God into that place of work, we're better able to discern when it's time to stay at a job or when to move on. Um, Sometimes we move on because we have a difficult situation and we're just, or something's awkward and we just want to get out of something that's really troubling to us. But sometimes that's a gift that God gives us to aid us in our discipleship. And sometimes when we move on before God's time, we miss a valuable opportunity of discipleship. And Jesus knows best where to plant us to cause us to become like him. And he also knows when it's time to move on. So when you've learned your lesson, sometimes when you've gained sometimes all that you can be discipled at a certain location, it is time. And the Lord will tell you. So how's that sound with regards to work? I might have just gray glanced over what Ken shared. But for me, that was just really encouraging. Some of it I knew. Some of it. I, it's just such a good reminder, but also if you haven't practiced that, I want to do that more. I want to see Jesus. Um, in the, the, f honestly, for me, in engineering, when I'm at engineering and I'm doing like math and my all sorts of things, sometimes there can be hours where I don't even think about God. It's just hours of just calculations and report writing, and what a waste of time, right? Like. I remember actually in college uh, inviting, I, I ended up, this is a longer story, but I ended up dropping out of college at the end of my sophomore year and then having these encounters with the Holy Spirit during a six month break, going back to college and then inviting the Holy Spirit to join me in my studies and then going from uh, having a 2-4 <laughs> at my last quarter at Oregon State University to being on the honor roll for the rest of my time there so being at the top of the class with a few buddies 
Um, so just inviting God into, into our space. Okay, let's move on. Um, those who are born again of the Spirit of God have the Spirit of God living inside of them. And there is a river that wells up on the inside of us and oh, uh, flows outward. John 7, 38, we read this at Life Group this week. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. The river doesn't just well up and, fl- and, and come up to make us feel good. That river goes somewhere. The river flows towards those who are broken and hurting, sick, the lost, and those in need of a savior. When I was young, I heard the analogy of the story of the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. Well, this Jordan River flows down to the Dead Sea, and then the Jordan River is full of life and and irrigates most of the the Jordan Valley, Israel, and Jordan on the other side. And when it gets to the Dead Sea, there's no outlet. The Dead Sea is, I believe, the lowest place on the natural place on the planet, and that place becomes a a stagnant uh, pool of salt, and there's nothing living in the Dead Sea that really is of any significance. Probably will, some biologists will come and be like, no, there's these little microorganisms. Or no, rather, you get my picture here. But when the river goes into a stagnant um, place, it becomes um, uh, stale and stinky and without life. And uh, this is a picture that I heard when I was young. It's always stuck with me. But when the river flows outward to those who are in need, when our lives are focused on others rather than ourselves, it stays fresh, and, we, and, and there is life. And so let's press on to talking about a few things that cause the river to flow out. Let's start with service. Now, this could be towards your family, your workplace, your fellow Christ followers, or humanity. Mark 10, 45, J- Jesus says this, Even the Son of Man did not come to serve, uh, but to be served. He did not come to be served, but to serve um, most people want to be served, and contrary to that, most people like being served. What would happen in our world today? Think about crises in the world today. Think about political divisions in our own country, injustices in society, the growing divide between the rich and the poor. If people, what would happen if people change their focus to serve rather than be served? The practice of service doesn't just have the potential to heal our broken world. Um, it has the potential to bring healing to those who serve, too. When we serve, we often think we're helping ourselves, uh, others, but we soon find out that we're the ones that being, are being helped. For me, this is especially being true. Um, I've often thought that I'm going to, where, like where Heather is right now in Malawi. Malawi is one of the poorest uh, countries in the world. And often when I've gone to some of the poorest countries in the world, I thought that I was taking Jesus or going to care for the poor or to go and help them out with something that they were in. And I got there, and I've often felt the one, like I was the one that got ministered to more as I got to hang out. with. When I was in Nepal, I went into homes that there wasn't even one toy. You know, you go down the poorest streets uh, of Walla Walla, and you see sometimes backyards filled with old toys. And there wasn't one plastic or metal toy in these Nepalese homes. The only toys that they would have been were like things made out of rocks or um, blocks or pieces of wood. Uh, But when you're around those people, you realize what really matters. It just absolutely changes you. Um, What happens when you serve others, and you don't have to go to another nation to do that, but when you serve others, it sets us free from our own self-focus, our self-obsession, our egos, and our entitlements. Um, Every teenager should go and hang out with the poorest of the poor. Um, So Jesus modeled service uh, when he washed his disciples' feet in uh, John 13 at the Last Supper. Um, But he concludes the washing of feet. He said, if you know these things, as he's talking and he's demonstrating on service, he says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Okay. The next thing that uh, we're going to talk about is justice with regards to reaching out. Now, God does justice. What is justice? Now, there's a lot of talk about what justice is in this nation today. A lot of people talk about social justice. But when God, God is definitely a God of justice. There's over 2,000 scriptures on God being a God of justice in the Bible, which is a lot uh, with regards to one theme. Now, 
biblical, we want to talk about biblical justice, redemptive justice, but what is biblical justice? Biblical justice is making wrong things right. I think another definition I could say would be loving the other. Loving the other. Um, but God does justice because of who he is. So um, as, we, as we learn about justice, as we are called to do justice, we have to realize that we're called to do justice God's way. So I want to be clear on that. We're not just um, going with a trend of society of trying to follow and, you know, make change. We're, we're doing uh, things his way. So God delights in justice. He's a restorer who makes wrong things right. Throughout scripture, God is the defender of the poor, the stranger, the widow, and the orphan. In Isaiah 61, 8, it says, For I, the Lord, I love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. That word wrongdoing is I hate injustice that is done uh, to you. So that's the wrongdoing. The Lord says, I hate that, and I love justice. Now, healing is one, physical healing is one of the expressions of God's justice, making wrong things right. When we pray for the blind and they see, when the blind see, justice has come. And their lives are restored to God's original intent that they would see. When the lame walk, God's justice has come, and that person's life is forever different. When you're in a wheelchair, or you're not in a wheelchair because you can't afford one, but you drag yourself around because your legs don't work, and you can't work, and God comes and he releases his kingdom, and you're physically healed, um, like the gentleman that we saw in India when dropped a bucket on his foot, and Josh prayed for him with another lady, and he was instantly healed. When that happens, your life is forever changed because now you can do things you're never able to do, and that is actually to provide for your family, which is huge. So that's justice. That's God's justice. The church was established in God's heart to bring tangible expressions of the kingdom to the world. And when the kingdom of God comes, it comes with justice. Coming to Jesus may begin with receiving his gift of salvation. But the transition from believer to discipleship literally means or is literally to give him our lives. So you might say yes to Jesus and believe that he's your savior, but then soon you will hear a call to follow him. Come follow me. Come follow me. Come do the things I'm doing. And that transition is to give him your life, to trust him. Um, Doing justice is inescapable for the life of a disciple attempting to follow Jesus. Jesus said, if, that, if we're going to be disciples, we're going to have to follow him where he is going. And sometimes that means finding out where he is and following him there. When disciples see injustice, they are moved with compassion, and this compels them to act. They understand that ju justice is central to the heart of Jesus and therefore it's essential to their hearts too. Disciples are called to action, to put hands and feet to the gospel, and this also means risk. But risk comes with an incredible reward because when we risk and disciples say yes, this dependency always leads to intimacy with Jesus. That's a pretty amazing reward. One significant part of doing justice is caring for the poor. In the U.S., a family is below the poverty threshold if they earn about $37,000 a year. Um, but biblical definition of the poor is a slightly different. Um, and I think it's important when you hear God's call to care for the poor, it's not that you don't care for your fellow human or your neighbor or love yourself, but there is a definition that is in Scripture of what the poor is. And the poor, or to tochos, um, they are the world's marginalized and vulnerable without any options. And the key is without any, other, when he, without any other options. The Greek word means to be reduced to beggary. They're helpless. They are powerless to accomplish an end. Sometimes there are people that are poor in our nation because they choose not to use the resources that are available to them. It doesn't mean we shouldn't help them, but they're not necessarily what the Bible defines as poor. So why should we concerned about the poor and the vulnerable? Because God is concerned for them. God cares for the poor. He has compassion on them, and they are precious to him. Let's look at Psalm 72. 
For he will deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also, and him who has no helper. He will spare the poor and the needy and will save the souls of the needy. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence, and precious shall be their blood in his sight. So from this verse, we see that he hears the cry of the poor. He spares them. He saves them. He redeems their life from oppression and violence. And precious is their blood in his sight. There is great benefit to caring for the poor, just in case you thought maybe there was, well, that's good for some, maybe not for me. Well, here, me, let me invite you into a little bit more. God blesses and delivers those who care for the poor. Psalm 41, 1 says, Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in the time of trouble. Now, if you're never going to face any trouble in life, that's okay. Then you don't have to worry about the poor, right? No, you still have to worry about the poor. <laughs> Um, God cares for the poor so much that he actually identifies himself with the poor. In Proverbs 19, 17, it says, He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord. In other words, those who care for the poor, those who give to the poor, actually giving to the Lord himself. Now, Jesus demonstrates this too. Jesus identified the poor in his life. He actually identified so much with the poor. He was born into poverty, and then he mostly ministered to those who were poor, the broken and the downtrodden. Here's one way that Jesus identifies with the poor. In Matthew 25, he says this, inasmuch as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it for me. Essentially what Jesus is saying in Matthew 25, you know, if you're, if you're not familiar with the scripture, I encourage you to go back, but he says, when you were naked and you clothed, when I was naked, you clothed me, when I was hungry and you fed me. But essentially Jesus is saying in Matthew 25, if you love me, you'll take care of the poor. And we see Jesus caring for the least throughout his ministry. <coughs> There's my quick <laughs> splash through justice trying to get done in time. But we'll revisit this. Um, justice, for those, uh, we haven't actually shared, had a preaching series on justice for a while, but it is dear to the heart of crazy love. And we will see that in different expressions uh, throughout and uh, there are things that we've done in the past that uh, we're constantly praying, Father, what are you doing? So like right now, our clothing closet is on hold, but we're constantly saying, Lord, what are you doing? So I want you to join me in that prayer. Um, with regards to service and justice, maybe praying, Lord, how can crazy love be a blessing in this city? How could we, how could we serve? And if there's something that you see, uh, let's talk about it. Let's, you know, we just we could try it out once and see if it's something that is um, something that really is something that God is partnering with us. Um, one of the things that Ken suggests with regards to service or justice is to find that one thing that God has really put in your heart. And sometimes when you do a hundred different things, sometimes it can your effectiveness can be diluted and he suggests picking one thing is it is it orphan care is it racial reconciliation is it the poor uh, is it is it what is your one thing that God has put on you to bring justice in this world one of the ways that you can answer that question is to ask yourself the question what irritates you and makes you angry so so let's talk about witness um, in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he invited his disciples to follow him. And in his uh, invitation to follow him, he said this, Follow me, and I will make you fishes of men. Now, I don't believe that was just to the twelve. I believe that invitation, or just like a prophetic word that is given to one person, sometimes it floats in the room, and you're like, man, that's for me too. I think this invitation here to be a fisher of men, uh, in men in general, Humanity, could be women, could be children, um, is for anybody who's saying, yes, that's for me. So in 2009, uh, We Crazy Love received a prophetic word that I still hold on to today. It said this, God will marry love and evangelism in Walla Walla and miracles will happen. So I've often reflected on that. God will marry love and evangelism in Walla Walla and miracles will happen evangelism, and I'll talk a little bit more and unpack that a little bit in a second, but evangelism always starts with loving God 
and then being loved by him. If our cup is not full, it's not overflowing. And if it's not overflowing, we don't have anything to give. So we spend a lot of time getting filled up here and enjoying being loved by God. Not just loving God. Loving God is so important. It's the first commandment. It's really important that the first commandment be first place. But we do spend a lot of time being loved by God because if we're not loved by God, we've got not much to give away, right? And so we want to get filled up. And uh, we, we do, even this year, we have these cycles built in. So this series on rule of life is getting, talking about practices and it's kind of been a, maybe a little bit heady. Well, our next series is Belovedness. We're just going to get ooey-gooey in the love of God in our next preaching series and just really get filled up with his love. And then I think we'll be talking more about evangelism and outreach in the weeks to come after that. Um, but yeah, evangelism always starts with loving God and being loved by him. And jo Jesus said this in John 15:5. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. And just as uh, babies come from intimate marriages, intimate relationships, spiritual babies come from intimate relationships, namely our relationship with Jesus. Okay, so the think the first step in being a witness is to really consider two texts and to really, I want to, I want to give these to you rather than teach on them today. I want to give them to you and just invite you to struggle with them, wrestle through them, pray through them, think on them, go and do word searches. They're two simple texts that you've heard probably a few times, but I think being a witness comes from us really struggling through this. So the first one is Jesus in Mark 16, 15 says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You might have heard that, but have you really taken a time to understand, just ask the question, what is the gospel? Go and do a word search of every time the word gospel or preach is in the scriptures. A Blue Letter Bible is a really great resource. You can just go type in the word preach into Blue Letter Bible and it'll all just... Highlight all the word preach in throughout the whole Bible or gospel, all, it'll highlight it. So go and, go and wrestle through that one. The second one is the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 1820. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Wrestle through that one, struggle through that one, going, is this a reality in my life? Am I seeing this? Am I discipling nations? Am I discipling other peoples? Am, am I seeing change? Am I equipping other people to encounter with God? If not, then I want to encourage you to wrestle on, with this and then go on a prayer walk. Just go pick a neighborhood. Lord, where are you in Walla Walla today? Where can I join you? Go on a prayer walk with him and then ask him. Say, Lord, these people that I'm walking by right now, these homes, these houses, these apartments, these stores, wherever God leads you, the school, how can I reach these people with you? How can I partner with you to, to rescue them and to disciple them, to teach them how about your love and how to love you in return? Sound good? I think that's where being a witness starts. Um, Jesus promised, you will receive power, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. The purpose of the anointing, the purpose of the river inside of you is to introduce Jesus to the world and make him famous. So another word for preaching the gospel, being a witness or making him famous is evangelism. So evangelism is simply being a witness for Jesus to those who don't know him. And evangelism is the natural outcome of intimacy with Jesus. It is accomplished by this. This is really profound, Peter. You might want to write this down. It is accomplished by those who are gifted and those who are not. It is accomplished especially by those who are available right? and those who are filled with God's love and those who look for opportunities to give his love away. I think the biggest difference is just becoming aware. So one of the things that we're going to do, we're going to introduce a regular rhythm of just doing outreaches and things like that. There are going to be lots of different kinds of outreaches. I know that going to door, door to door is not everybody's favorite cup of tea. Personally, I hate going door to door.
But I do that because I know that sometimes that's the only Jesus people will ever see. And, um, and I've got, we've got some great tools. Um, I was sent door to door when I went on a summer uh, outreach with a little booklet. And our goal was to convince people to go through the booklet with me. And I was barely a follower of Christ. That was probably the worst thing that could ever happen to me. It forever scarred me and never made me want to do evangelism ever again. Uh, but when we go, we go with fruit and we say, here, God loves you so much. We brought you a bag of fruit. Would you like prayer for anything? And when Jesus, people have an encounter or see healing or have an encounter with God's presence, we say, would you like to know the Jesus that just healed you? I love that model a little bit better. So anyways, that's kind of what we do. But we'll have lots of different other things this year uh, to put that into practice. Looking for opportunities. I think one of the things that when we do it kind of as a community and we do it together, then the most important thing is not that we're doing events for evangelism, like our Lunar New Year outreach, our Christmas party, all our parties that we do. The main reason we do those is to celebrate people, but also to do outreach. But our main thing is not that we do events or, or have uh, programs of evangelism. The most important thing with regards to evangelism is that we're reaching out to those who are in our everyday lives that we see on a daily basis. And sometimes when we do it in community together, then we become more aware of the person that's sitting in the office right next to you that you go, oh, I see they're having a bad day. Maybe I can offer to pray for them. And you may not have thought about that, but maybe you're thinking about that now, so good. Um, so that's who does evangelism, those who are gifted and those who are not, those who are available. Uh, those who are looking for it. The thing about evangelism is that we can't save anybody, and nor are you responsible to save anybody. Jesus is the one that saves people. He's the Savior, right? All you're called to do is go and preach the gospel and to make disciples. You're not even called to make believers, right? You're called to make disciples. So we're completely dependent on the Holy Spirit. Um, if we convince someone to follow Jesus, then someone else can convince them not to follow Jesus, or some other thing in our culture can convince them to not follow Jesus. What people really need is they need an encounter with their living God. Now, I can share the gospel with people. And I can give them a four-step message on why they need a Savior and why Jesus died on the cross and that he's alive and his blood covers their sin. But about 30 minutes later, 90% of what I just shared with them, they won't remember. But if they have an encounter with the tangible love of God and feel God's presence, they'll never forget that their whole life. People really, especially our teenagers, our teenagers right now desperately need to have a raw encounter with the living God that they'll never forget, that they'll say, yes, I want to know that God and follow him. So we are completely dependent on the Holy Spirit. Evangelism is partnership. John 6, Jesus said this, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last days. So we can't even come to God unless the Father draws us. So who is God drawing in our community to him? Who is God drawing? Who is the Father labeled? Who is, who is Jesus already with right now drawing them unto himself? And we just come to go. Now, I know we've talked to a lot of people that aren't quite ready. They're not you know, and, and we get discouraged, and we're like, oh, that's the last time I'm going to do evangelism. I tried that. that. That was awful. I got rejected. But let's open our eyes. Let's really practice discernment and come alongside those who are desperate and needy, and that the Father is marked and drawing them. When you say, may I pray for you, they say, yes, please. I've been waiting. I've been waiting for someone to come along and just show me the way. I was that teenager. I didn't have anyone that really came alongside me to disciple me. I was so desperate for discipleship. That's one of the reasons I became a youth pastor was because I could give something away that I never had. Others are in the same place. They're just waiting for you. We are the ones who share the good news of Jesus. He is the one who converts and saves. Jesus is the Savior, and people need to have an ingenuine encounter with him. And the last key I want to leave you with is obey the Great Commission one soul at a time. This is what Ken Shigematsu says. This is what Heidi Baker practices. She says, what do you do when you have thousands of orphans? What do you do when you have thousands of people in poverty? She says this, you stop for the one. Who's the person right in front of you? How can you care for that person? How can you compare, 
care for the person that's in the cubicle next to you? How can you care for your neighbor across the street? How can you care for that person that just looks like they're carrying the world on their shoulders in the grocery store? Okay, why don't we stand? Thank you. It would have been less time if Heather had been with me. <laughs> Some of those things were so good, I just had to get them all out in this last hurrah on rule of life. But we will, we will return to rule of life occasionally. We're going to see how we can do this in community. We'll probably gather like intercessors together and say, how can we do intercession at Crazy Love? We'll probably gather the outreach missionaries and evangelists and say, how can we get all the crazy love? To We're going to talk about that, how to establish healthy rhythm. So workshop will be coming. If you're interested, let Heather know, um, and she'll probably put that on the calendar. So look forward to that. Nicole, you're in the room. There's a lot I talked about today. Um, but there may be one thing that you would love if I could have the prayer ministry team come on up. Um, I Maybe there's one thing in what I shared today that you would just love someone to partner with you um, just to say, you're saying yes to the Lord. You're like, Lord, I want to try something different. Maybe it's re with regards to your work. Maybe it's regards to reaching out or outreach, um, witness, being a witness or justice or just serving. Maybe there's one thing that you're saying, Lord, I want to I step into that. I want to take a risk with you. I want to see what will happen when I say yes to you. If you're, if you're in that boat today and you would just love someone to just come alongside with you and pray with you, won't you come on up? It just could be anything that I shared this morning. Um, but I'll make it even broader. <laughs> if there's anything right now that is troubling you, if you're carrying the world on your shoulders, if there's healing that you, you need, I, I always love to offer. I don't, don't like to talk about healing. I talked about healing today and then I'll not offer it. So as I talked about healing today, Jesus is the healer. He is here. He is ready to heal. If you need healing, come on up front. Holy Spirit, what else are you doing? You're opening eyes to see Jesus. Yeah, you're kissing our eyes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Um, the work during our worship service, I always try to get as close to the Holy Spirit as I can. I really try hard to listen to what he has to say to all of us. So it's a little off your subject, Andrew, but it is what's happening in our world today. And the Holy Spirit, I don't know if it has captured your hearts, it makes you cry what you see happening in the world makes me cry. And so God said, and he wanted this for all of you. This is Deuteronomy 6. I don't have my glasses, so bear with me. These are the commands, decrees, and laws of the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them May fear the Lord your God as long as you live. Boy, I can hardly talk. By keeping all of his decrees and commandments that I give you, and so that you may enjoy your long life. It's hard to read through tears. Hear Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord the God of your can you finish that because I can't read through my tears and I'm right here Hero Israel be careful to obey all that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord the God of your ancestors promised you keep on going oh, that's so it what God wants us to know is to come.
come. And he's given us all that promise again today. Um, encouraging in, in relationship to that, and if you're reading the news, um, there are things happening, <laughs> lots of things, but we get to in, in, invited to be a partner with Jesus in shaping history. Um, an incredible book that uh, is called um, Intercessor by Reese Howell talks about a prayer group that was used and to partner with God to see amazing things happen in the Second World War. So if we're talking about current world situations right now, God is inviting you into the throne room to partner with him. So don't just read the news and go, in, oh, what do we do? You know exactly what to do. Fall on your knees and join your Heavenly Father to see his kingdom come. So come forward for prayer if you need prayer. Otherwise, bless you. Have an amazing week in your work, in your Reach out. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. In the name of Jesus, amen.